Does the foot follow the pelvis when you're performing a hinge activity? Good morning. Happy Friday. I have Neuro Coffee in hand and it is perfect. All right, we are back on schedule. Um, and so we got to get busy today. So we're going to dig right into the Q&A. And this one comes from Mihail. And Mihail says, hey, Bill. Hey, Mihail. Can you please explain what's going on with the foot during a hinge? From my understanding, the bottom of the hinge, the pelvis and the femur go towards IR, but the foot supinates into ER. Then as this movement reverses, the foot pronates IR, but the pelvis and hips ER. Is that correct? Or am I missing something? Well, this is actually really, really interesting. It's actually a pretty good question because um, it doesn't appear to be as clear and clean as we would like, but the principles hold in regards to the inner effects of, of movement and as well as our transitions from, from inhale to exhale to inhale to ER to IR to ER states. And so let's, let's break this down into some pieces. We'll talk about the theoretical uh, representation first so we have some some frame of reference to work from we'll talk about the hinge part first and so when we talk about about the difference between like a hinge and a squat if, if, we, if we're going to use that terminology um, our hinge we're going to assume that we have full excursion of breathing available to us before we initiate the the forward bend into the hinge but the the hinge is going to bias us towards a nutated position of the sacrum and what this allows is for the the pelvis to move posteriorly as we bend forward because otherwise if we didn't counterbalance we just face plant and so we need to have some element of, of posterior expansion. So we get that in that posterior lower aspect of the pelvis. This is gonna move the acetabulum towards an IR position. So we get an, an IR position at the hip. And, and then if we, if we look on down the, the extremity, we're gonna look at the knee. The knee's gonna to have to unlock. So it's, the knee's gonna to have to bend and that's gonna to move towards internal rotation as well. So we'll have a tibia that's internally rotating on the, the femur, which would be the position that we need for normal knee flexion. And then if we go on down to the foot then, what we'll see is we'll see a, a foot that will move from its initial inhaled position, if you will, which would be ER supination. It'll move towards pronation. And that's gonna happen somewhere in that general vicinity of about 90 degrees of the, the traditionally measured hip flexion in the imaginary sagittal plane. And then obviously to come out of that, we would just simply reverse, reverse gear. So we're gonna move from our IR position back to our, our ER position. Now, that's theoretical. So let's talk about reality because the way that these things get performed in the gym tends to not be so clean. And so what we'll typically see is we'll see people moving into their, their so-called hinge patterns like your Romanian deadlift would be, would be a, a, a good one as a representation is that most people are gonna go past that, that theoretical 90 degrees of hip flexion, which means that we're gonna move from our IR bias back to an ER bias, but we're also gonna shift more load anteriorly. And so what that's gonna do, when we talk about the forces down into the ground, we're gonna move that, that foot towards its position of, of late propulsion, right? So, so as, I, as I would shift my, my foot forward, so the center of gravity is moving forward over the foot, what should happen is like if I was walking, I would be able to pick that heel up. But because we've got this posterior weight shift, the heel's gonna get stuck to the ground. So I've got a foot that's moving into an ER position, but I also have a pelvis that's moving into an ER position. So I have a constraint problem that I'm gonna run into. So as I nutate this and I start to, to, to flex forward, I get posterior expansion but I can only expand so much in this direction. And so then what I'm gonna to have to do, because I'm increasing the degree of hip flexion, I'm moving towards an ER inhale position, I'm actually gonna counter nutate. I'm gonna to move towards counter nutation. So I'm gonna get a posterior expansion this way, which is still gonna help me keep my center of gravity backwards over my foot. But, but I've got this foot in a, in a late propulsive strategy. So this is where we're gonna see that, that ER position. Now, 
if everything's moving towards this, this ER position, even though I'm still forward bent, I still need to have an internal rotation force into the ground. And so where we're gonna see that occur is in the thoracolumbar junction. So we're gonna see that above the lumbar spine, and that's gonna give us enough downward force. So, so we need to have a, a position in the center of gravity that's towards the, the middle of, of, our, of our stance and, and slightly in front so we can maintain our balance. And so what we end up with in this scenario as we pass the, the IR element of, of this, this uh, hinging activity is we're gonna get a concentric overcoming posterior lower pelvis and thorax. We'll get a concentric yielding at the sacral base and in the dorsal rostral. And so it'll look something like that, okay? And so this is gonna be what we'll typically see in the gym. So if you ever work with Olympic weightlifters or you've done enough RDLs in, in your, your lifetime, this is what you're typically gonna see. Now, we can also see some extreme versions of this. And so, so this is another representation and what you're actually seeing is a much stronger compensatory strategy to get internal rotation at that thoracolumbar junction. So we're actually getting some of that that posterior lower compression coming into play. And so what this may be from a diagnostic standpoint is an indication that this person needs to capture some more internal rotation. Now, it is possible that we can get more internal rotation at the hip, but it's gonna depend on stance width um, and, and um, the actual orientation of the thorax as to whether we can acquire some of that internal rotation at the hip, but it is possible. Now. If we add load to this, obviously we're gonna get more compressive strategy. We're gonna get more superficial concentric orientation, which is immediately going to, to uh, limit um, what we're gonna have available to us. So when it comes to trying to recapture that, that uh, um, uh, internal rotated position, it's gonna be much more difficult to do. And so a lot of times what you're gonna see is you're gonna see that a much earlier ER compensatory strategy under these circumstances. So you'll see people separate their knees as they're trying to, to initiate their hinge, or you'll see them have to make an adjustment in their, in their stance width. So Mihail, I would refer you to the kettlebell swing diagnosis video for an example of what I'm just talking about where we're seeing the, the extreme ER co compensatory strategies. So basically you can see that it's not as clean as we would like it to be, but the principles do hold. I'm moving from ER strategies to IR strategies to ER strategies under every circumstance. It's just a matter of where it's gonna happen. And that's gonna be dependent on how much movement we're, we're trying to acquire, how much load we're using, what's our stance with, and any pre-existing compensatory strategies. So great question, Mihail. Hope it's helpful for you. If I didn't answer your question effectively, then please go to askbillhartman at gmail.com, askbillhartman at gmail.com, and have a great weekend. I'll see you guys next week.